Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the March Tier 3 Principal and Coach Meeting. If everyone could just take a few minutes and put their name and the role that they play in their school in the chat, that would be really helpful. We do use this information just to keep documentation of the support that we're providing to our identified schools. So my name is Monique Sullivan and I am the Continuous School Improvement Coordinator. Although I am listed under ESCA, I work with the assessment team under the Maine's Model of School Supports, which falls under several different sections of the ESSA statute, Section 1003 and then Section Title I, Section 1111. So you might see me on, I'm kind of sitting in between teams with the work that I do. Also, I listed all of our school leadership coaches. So these are all the coaches that help support our schools that have been identified for tier three or CSI supports. And the next few slides are really about the main Department of Education. I'm not going to read them. I'm just showing them to you. And you can go back and review them when this PowerPoint gets or the slide deck gets uh, uploaded to YouTube um, in the recording. It'll also be a part of the slide deck, which I will send to you through the Grants for Me notification, email notification system. And it's taking me roughly about two or three days to get it uploaded. So it should be ready sometime early next week uh, for you guys to go in and review the recording, but to also um, look at the slide deck and any other documents that I use in this presentation. So here's our mission. Here's our vision, our department's vision, and then the strategic priorities. And so the mission and the vision and the strategic priorities are the driving force of all the work that we do at the department. So all the work we do with schools, all the documentation, all the resources, all the technical assistance, it's all based on our mission and our vision and the strategic priorities. So today's objectives are really to stay informed about the latest grant requirements and updates, use the year at a glance as a monitoring tool and to plan leadership team meetings, connecting the comprehensive needs assessment or slash school-wide uh, plan, to the SIG application, and I also threw in the ESA consolidated application because all tier three schools have the authority or supposed to have the authority to operate Title I school-wide programs. And when you have a when you operate a Title I uh, Title school-wide program, you're supposed to have a school-wide plan, which we also um, use the same template for our comprehensive needs assessment. And then lastly, based on feedback, that you guys provided to us at the February tier three principals meeting. Uh, we actually invited a, a principal, a school to come and speak or share about how they're using their SIG funds to help support their professional learning, uh, which is tied directly to their continuous school improvement plan and their SIG application. So um, that will be toward the end of the presentation and I'm hoping toward the end of this webinar and hopefully that will take the bulk of it. I'm gonna do my part pretty quickly because uh, I want to leave a lot of time um, for the school presentation. Uh, we're hoping that the professional learning, that you'll learn some essentials for planning and participating in whole school and out of, whole school out of district professional learning, that you'll be able to make connections and having about and having one continuous school improvement plan, and then takeaways learning how one school is connecting the professional learning to their SIG application. So updates, um, just some information. There aren't really any updates for the grant, so there won't be any grant uh, requirement uh, uh, kind of informational sessions in this one. So um, 2024 Maine's Model of School Support Survey. This is for schools identified for Tier 3 supports or CSI. Um, this form is for principals to complete. Responses from this form, or sorry, this responses from the survey will be used to assess the effectiveness of current supports being provided to schools identified for tier three supports under Maine's model of school supports, plan for future supports uh, for identified schools 
and also to help the main department of education fill out required reports uh, that are required by the U.S. Department of Education, what we call EDFACs. All federal programs have to do this, and the performance reports help us fill in all those numbers. The due date for this is April 11th, um, and some of you have already filled this out because you got, I sent the, um, the survey um, email notification through the Grants for Me um, notification system, and I think I sent it a couple of weeks ago. I will put that in the chat um, right now if you don't have it. And I know the coaches were also made aware of it, so you may also have gotten this information from them. So I just put that in the chat. And I know there's gonna be a question about, don't you already have this information? Uh, no, we don't have all of the information. Uh, the performance reports are supposed to be completed each year, which is required of all federal programs, especially ESCA or ESSA. Uh, unfortunately, SIG funds really haven't had to do performance reports in the past. Uh, as you all know, we had a huge audit by the US Department of Education in May of 2023, and they highlighted some areas that we weren't really doing a great job at. And one of those was requiring performance reports and really monitoring um, school improvement funds. So you're gonna be starting to see that. So this survey is kind of a, a workaround for FY22 SIG funds and FY23 SIG funds. It's not a complete performance report, um, it, but it has some essential elements that we are gonna to use to report back to the feds. So it is really, we really do need this information. And some of it we don't have because your plan may say something, but in reality, you may have done something else. So it's a it's a way for kind of that cross check between what you said you were going to do and what you actually did. Um, I know that there were some uh, and a few of the, of the of a little bit of the feedback that I re uh, looked at or the response that I looked at. Some a couple of principals were like, or some people who filled out the form said, "Well, I can't do this information when it came to the financial part of it," but as principals. You built this budget with your leadership team. You should know what you've spent your money on. You should know what you spent your FY22 funds are up to this point. You should know what you've spent your FY23 funds up to this point. You probably need to go talk with your business manager. And I did put that in the survey that it's recommended you go meet with your business manager or whoever does your invoicing in your, in your, um, in your district or your SAU to just iron that out. If you said you were going to spend $100,000 on something, you need to go and check did you actually spend it on that. Um, and get reimbursement for it, get invoiced for that as well, to get that reimbursement back. Um, and so that's, we really, we really do need that information from you. And you have a few, I gave you over a month to do it, because I know you have a lot of things to do on your plate. So hopefully, and it's mostly uh, multiple choice, there's only a couple of narratives, so it shouldn't take you that long to fill it out. I try to make it as quick and easy as possible. The next thing on the update is Maine's model of school support identification timeline for FY24. A lot of things are coming together. Um, we did get approval for our amendment, uh, but now we're just trying to, to get all of the identifications made, making we're cross-checking, we're making sure everything is right, we're making sure that when we give you out this information, we have cross-checked it so many times that um, hopefully there won't be any um, errors or um, anything that doesn't look right. It is forthcoming. Uh, I don't want to give you a date yet because if we don't meet that, um, it just kind of, but hopefully it'll be um, soon. And I know as soon is one of those words that everybody starts to not like very much, but it we're getting closer. Um, and when we do get closer to making those identifications and when we make the identifications, uh, we will be notifying you. We will also be uh, having separate meetings and webinars for the different types of identifications. Um, so we'll have some for the newly identified for um, tier three. We'll have the ones, there are 52 schools that had the potential to exit tier three status. So we'll be notifying you. Uh, we'll notify you if you're a school that wasn't able to exit status. We'll notify schools if they are now in tier one, ATSI. Um, there won't be any tier two identified because that's on a three-year cycle. And we just identified um, in FY23 with 21, 22 data. So there won't be a new set of tier two schools or um, TSI schools. Um, the next one is we have no update on the ESA federal programs coordinator. So we don't have that yet. And then the next one is the 
FY23 and FY24 SIG funds invoicing, I did put out a couple of uh, notifications through grants for me at the earlier in earlier in the month. Some of you may not have got them, gotten them because they were geared toward the schools that were unable to exit. But some of this information actually applies to all schools that have received um, SIG funds. So in particular, um, FY23, those funds do expire on 9-30-2024. So that's like about six months away. So um, start thinking about that. And there is no extension on this because that was already granted a tidings, a one-year tidings waiver. So there will be no more, there will be no extension on those funds. Uh, but this may change if you are a school that is able to exit. So when we make the identifications for FY24, if your school exits and there are uh, potentially 52 of you that could exit, it's really, really, really important that you, you obligate those funds by 6 30, 2024. You will still have until 9 30 to spend them, but you need to get them obligated. You need to have a purpose for those funds. And what that obligation will look like, we're still working on, and we'll have that ready for when uh, we make the identifications. Uh, but you really need to plan what you're going to do in July, August, and September now and have that um, really. Um, solidified by June 30th because our, we don't like to return funds. And so if you don't have a solid plan, we're probably going to take those funds and we're going to reallocate them for other programs or other schools or whatever program we have because nobody likes to return funds. So we really, really want you to obligate those FY23 funds. Um, for FY24, the, um, in the period of obligation or the period of availability or period of allowability. It has like all these different ways we re reference them. But the last day that you can um, incur a cost for FY24 funds is also 9-30-2024. Um, we are in the process right now of requesting, well, we're not, we're in the first stage of requesting a tidings waiver amendment, which is a one-year amendment for the FY24 funds, SIG funds. Uh, we put in the newsroom, there is a request for public comment. The U.S. Department of Education requires us to get public comment when we request the tidings waiver, and they actually look at more favorably if we have people that actually we have quite if we actually have um, uh, public comment on that. So that being said, that has not been granted yet. But take that aside. If you are a school that is that is going to exit or does exit has a potential to exit, the same rules will apply for FY24 for FY23. So again, if you are a school that might exit and you have your FY24 SIG funds, get those funds obligated by 630. Start talking now what you're going to do in July, August, and September um, so that you're that you're not like on, we don't say in June, hey, what are you doing with these funds? Okay, you don't have a plan. We're taking them or we're going to reallocate them again because nobody wants to return funds. Um, so that's another thing to think about. Okay. So I don't, I'm, I don't, I'm not trying to stress anyone out, but I also don't want on June 15th, you know, people going, I didn't know about this. So we're trying to, to get it out there. The coaches know about this. They're, they are working with their schools as well that are, have the potential to exit. Um, so there won't be any surprises, hopefully. And then the last just information is uh, Jen Robitaille. She's um, the math. She works on the Aussie team, and she gave me the notification that there is a new Math for Me cohort that is um, been that's that's coming about. And then, if you wanted more information, you can go to the MDOE website for that information. And I only have like a couple more slides here because we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna spend the bulk of the presentation with our school. Um, so a year at a glance again. Here's March. Um, today's focus is on revisiting and updating the CNA and the root cause analysis. This is not new. And then the crosswalk. So as I mentioned last meeting, I really wanted there to be more of a focus on connecting all your plans um, and all the things that you're doing. So I'm going to I'm going to date myself and I'm going to make a Highlander reference, but there really can only be one. In theory, there should only be one plan, continuous school improvement plan. And every school, regardless of their identification status, should have a continuous school improvement plan that is based on student needs. We call that the comprehensive needs assessment. The SAU 
should help schools support their continuous school improvement plans. And the SAU's own CNA should almost be like a compilation of all the school's CNAs or all the school's school improvement plans. Because the, the district is supposed to support um, the school's continuous school improvement plans. Oops. Schools should not have multiple plans. I hear all the time from schools that they have a SIG plan, an ID local entitlement plan, a PBIS plan, a BAR plan, an instructional professional learning plan, and the list goes on. Again, there should really only be one plan. And I often hear, um, and just, I just want to go back and reference PBIS and MTSS. Um, MT, MPBIS, sorry, PBIS and MTSS are not interventions. I read a lot of that in our plans um, in these uh, school improvement applications. I'm using PBIS as my intervention. I'm using MTSS as my intervention. They're not, they're not interventions, they're frameworks. Um, you know, PBIS is a school-wide framework that teaches students about behavior expectations and strategies to promote good behavior and school safety. MTSS is a system, a systemic continuous improvement framework in which data-based problem solving and decision making is practiced across all levels of the educational system for supporting schools. So again, when you talk about PBIS and MTSS, they're frameworks, they're not interventions. So keep that in mind. Conducting a needs assessment to create and monitor the continuous school improvement plan is an evidence-based practice. And the current comprehensive needs assessment or CNA template that we provide um, at the Department of Education is a structure for how to conduct a needs assessment and also to create a continuous school improvement plan. As the CNA is currently structured, it's actually more than just a needs assessment. It's actually a continuous school improvement plan and everything else should line up to it. And I recognize that almost all programs have their own requirements but they should all be embedded in the continuous school improvement plan. And then I put on here, think about section 10. So all tier three schools or CSI schools um, were supposed to be school-wide or operate title one school-wide programs. And there's a part of the template that we use that includes section 10, which is physical requirements, because you're supposed to throw all your resources in to support this plan, this continuous school improvement plan or school-wide plan. Um, and currently, like I said, we use the template we provide is we call it the comprehensive needs assessment. You might need to add programming or accountability measures to your comprehensive needs assessment or continuous school improvement plan to meet other programmatic requirements like an IDA or some of those, those other programs. But again, there should only be one plan. Again, I hear all the time from schools that I don't have time to do all the work that's required for the SIG, SIG application. But in reality, you should not have to do extra work because it should all be coming from the school's continuous school improvement plan, which again, at the department, we provided the CNA template as just a way to write it down and to record it. If the CNA or your continuous school improve, if the CNA template is um, truly a continuous school improvement plan, all you need to do is copy and paste into your SIG application and into your ESA consolidated application. So what I did was I created a uh, attempt, I created a crosswalk, and that's what's on the right side of this slide uh, deck, sl or this page. Um, I took the tier three SIG application, I took the Title I school-wide plan, um, the CNA SWP, and also the ESA consolidated application. For those of you who don't understand why this ESA consolidated application is in there, um, it's because the ESA consolidated application, application for all your Title I schools that operate a school-wide program, they have to have specific projects. They have to be a part of your ESA consolidated application. They should be the same. It should align all together. Um, and then I also put connections on there. I'm gonna stop my screen for a second so that I can just show you that real quickly, what that looks like. I will provide um, I will provide a copy of that screenshot to you guys. Um, actually, I'm going to wait. I'll show it to you at the end. 
That way I can keep on track here. So I am going to come back. Okay, so I'll sh I'll probably I'll try to put that in there. I'll try to show that a little bit later. I don't I'm I'm getting a little over my time here. Um, so yeah, I will provide the the screen. I'll provide that crosswalk for you. This is just a quick snippet of it, uh, but I'll provide that to you. And if we have time at the end, I'll walk you through it. Um, I'll share my screen and walk you through it. But I don't want to run past my time that I allotted for myself. So that's it. Uh, and then now that's pretty much it for my present for my part of this presentation. Uh, you do want to think about how many plans do you have currently in your school uh, so that you can think about it being um, one continuous plan and not just a bunch of plans that you're just trying to constantly try to keep track of. Uh, I just have just want to go through this last three three slides so we can have the remainder of this time for our school. So again, we have our resources and opportunities. We have the uh, the websites here you can go to. There's the professional development calendar, which is located, located on the Department of Education's website. Um, if you need to contact us, here's my information for, for, uh, for fiscal. You can talk to or reach out to Tyra. And then um, right now, before we till we get a coordinator for the ESCA team, uh, Jeanette Kirk is um, our supervisor at this point. And then lastly, this is how you can get um, Find out all there is to know about the Department of Education. We have all of our methods of communication here on this website. So I'm good. I'm two minutes early from what I gave myself. So um, the next part of this is uh, our school presentation. Uh, this is the connections between professional learning and the SIG application. And I am, while I'm doing that, I want to go ahead and give. Uh, so while I'm getting setting up uh, Christina, so Christina is a principal at Silvi Silvio J. Gilbert School, and she was very kind to um, offer to present about how her school is using SIG funds to participate in whole school out of district professional learning connected to the SIG application and to continue school improvement plan. So feel free to write down any questions in the chat or save them to ask at the end of the presentation. And additionally, her coach her school coach is also going to help with that presentation and that is kathy so if you guys give me two seconds i'm going to stop sharing and then i'm going to give christina yeah and christina you're all set you should be able to share and um let's all you know so welcome christina thank you so much Oh, Kathy, I think you're uh, muted. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Kathy Elkins. I coach four schools, and I have the privilege today to kind of help Christina think about what she actually did and her leadership team did to get an out-of-state conference uh, approval and why it was important. And I provided her with a number of questions, but being the leader that she is, she took those questions and created a very impressive slideshow. So um, you won't hear too much from me because Christina's got the whole show ready. So Christina, take it away. Thanks guys. Um, hi everybody. I'm over in Augusta at Gilbert School and we went on an out of state conference last year and we're going on another one over spring break. And so I just wanted to touch on how we got that approved um, so that maybe some of that can help um, guide some of your decisions with professional development. I'm relatively new to Maine and so I was a principal out of state and at um, at that, in that state, we went on quite a few of these. And so I was fortunate to have some training in, in how to work with that. And so I'm hoping it can help you with um, deciding what to do. So Gilbert School, this is just a quick snapshot of us. Um, we're in Augusta, we have 320 students and 57 staff members, and you're welcome to come visit anytime you want. 
So um, reasons that we chose to go on an out-of-state conference, um, that would be most important as a leadership team. We got together and decided why do we want to do that? So we really wanted that intense focus just on learning together. We thought it would enhance our professionalism going somewhere where it's just um, educators all together learning that that would be, a, and, and it is, it's really beneficial just as a professional to go with other professionals and discuss. It really increased our team bonding. We did lose a person in the airport and we had to go running through the airport. And <laughs> so we were very well bonded by the end of that adventure. Um, we were able to learn from some national experts, which was great, and network with teachers from all over the world. And it also, most importantly, provided some PD in the areas that we identified were our big areas of focus. Um, and I'll, I'll delve into that a little bit more. So we really worked as a leadership team um, to get together and decide what are our criteria. So there are hundreds and hundreds of national conferences. And we really wanted to talk about what are our criteria. So for example, one leadership team member brought a um, idea to go to a PD that takes place on a cruise that goes to the Bahamas and they have some teachers on that cruise. And we and that did not fly, that we thought that maybe would be <laughs> excessive, although it sounded fun. So we really wanted to talk about what the criteria were. For us, I'm sure you don't have this problem, but we struggle to get subs. And so we really needed it to take place in a time that was um, either on a February break, April break, or summer, because that that's the only time that we were able um, to pull that many staff members off of the school site. Um, and then we had other criteria too, which I'll get into. So we had we lined up some PDs and we decided, okay, here as a team, everyone brought their ideas, including the crews, and said. Um, another person brought a really great PD that took place in Orlando, but her selling point was it's next to Disney. So that also didn't work. It didn't fit into our school plan. Um, but we got all those together and then we kind of hashed out what would be our best criteria. We all voted. And then we really hashed out as well who could attend. I would love to take all 57, but the leadership team had a big part in deciding who needs to go, um, which grade levels, which teachers, which staff members, and where that biggest point of impact would be. We also needed people that would come back and share that information out really um, effectively and, and spread that. And so we spent a long time on these three questions both years. Um, in order to identify appropriate PD, um, our criteria, criteria, we had to find some that really directly related to our root causes. Um, we needed PD with evidence-based strategies. We included everything in our action plan and I'll share some of that verbiage as well. So hopefully that can help you. Um, we had to explain how that can connect our this PD, how does it directly connect to our plan. And then we one of the most important things was sharing out how are we going to evaluate whether it was good and then share that information um, and spread it throughout the rest of the staff without just saying we're going to come back and do an early release day, you know, um, PowerPoint. It had to be more um, in depth than that and be able to be spread throughout the school. So those were some of our criteria as well. Um, so this we used as our guide. It's Gloria Ladson Billings, who is a you know been around a long time, but it's her components of effective effective PD. So these were the five pieces that we said, hey, whatever we pick has to be able to have these. And we wrote um, an addendum, which I'll share with you, that we attached to our to our application that went into detail on all of these components. There's a lot of space in that application, but not enough for all of this. So we included all of this separately because it is a, a lot of money that we're spending and we really wanted to show, hey, we're, we're being good stewards of that. Um, and so this was the verbiage we used and you're, you're welcome to look at that. The specific PD that we went to, this was um, how we identified that it filled fulfilled those five areas of um, of the components for effective PD. So we used verbiage um, that related to ours, whatever you chose as a conference or an out of out of state or wherever um, PD, yours would be more, uh, you know, attuned to whatever your um, PD was and how that worked. But for us, this was our verbiage. Um, our root cause analysis, and I know everyone's is different, but our root cause analysis, once we completed that, these were our three areas. And I just kind of, um, shortened up our, our verbiage on that and put that under. But our big big pieces that we needed after doing all of our root cause analysis was on math instruction, literacy instruction, and family involvement. And we thought those were the three areas that we really wanted to focus on. And we wanted to find a PD that would fit all three of those areas. Um, 
So that also drove some of our search. So when we found the PD that we went to, it provided um, PD in these three er in these three areas. Hold on, I have to get a tissue. I'm so sorry. Allergies are killing me. All right. So the PD fit those root causes by providing training in the following. And I included this in the addendum as well. So we put here's our root causes. Here's how it meets, you know, in order to help with those root causes. And so this was some of the verbiage that we used. This PD provided training in increasing rigor and relevance in using effective questioning strategies. And I and and so all of these evidence based strategies or evidence based practices, the PD focused on those. And so I. I um, wanted to demonstrate that we were covering those areas and it was effective. So just really quick academic outcomes. It was effective. So when you look at some of our increases, apparently except sixth grade math, which I don't know what happened there. But other than that, it was very effective. And so we did want to show once we went, hey, it did what we brought back and we really tried to implement did work for us. It made some things. Our big focus also was on climate and culture. And so we had surveyed the prior to going, we came back, we implemented a bunch, and then we resurveyed at the same time this year. And so some of our, um, so the light, the, um, the light blue is staff, the dark blue is students, and the orange is parents and families. And it just showed um, an increase fall 22 to fall 23. And these are people on a one to five Likert scale who picked four or five. So I always, or I almost always agree with these statements. And so this was kind of our climate survey. We were working again, one of those root cause analysis pieces was on parent involvement or parent engagement, um, bringing parents into school. And so this one here, parents are encouraged to be part of the school community. That one was really where we wanted to increase. Um, and and we did a little, I mean, but it was all it was already pretty high, but we're just trying to find other ways um, to bring that in. So we did have some good outcomes from it. Um, some here's some big advice that I would share with you, and and I'll I'll give you some resources too, and then I can answer questions or you can email me later, whatever. Um, so here are some tips if you're going to take a bunch of your staff on a conference, which I recommend highly. I mean, there's really nothing that um, can bring a staff together, especially after COVID, everyone's feeling very isolated and kind of feeling like um, they're on an island a little bit. And by attending something like this, we were able to combine together and really bond, but also we were able to meet with other teachers and go, oh my gosh, this person's from Minnesota or Nicaragua a teacher, and we all feel we're facing these similar challenges and you feel a little bit more um, connected. And we've stayed in close contact with a lot of those people. So here's my advice for you if you choose to go this route. Um, first, I would treat it very professionally. And, and by that, what I mean is you're taking a staff um, and it may be on vacation time, but you're going and it's your job. So anything that you wouldn't do at your job, for example, um, if someone says, wow, the conference is in San Diego and that is a lovely place. My husband always wanted to go to San Diego. So he's going to fly and meet me. He'll just, we'll, we'll get our own room. And I would say, no, we wouldn't bring our husband to our job unless you're fortunate or unfortunate enough to work with your husband on site. But we wouldn't bring our husband to our job. We wouldn't bring our child to our job. We wouldn't bring our whatever else to our job. So I highly recommend that if you are taking a staff, you take your staff and that's what it's for. I recommend that you fly together, that you get there together, that you stay in the same hotel, that you eat together, that 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 it's a work event. And so I think um, when we went, we had a pretty tight itinerary. I think the first day they had a couple hours and some people went to like a Harry Potter museum or different things and that's fine. Other than that, we were working the entire time. And I think that's really important um, because it's it's a work event and it's federal funds. And I don't think it should be used as a, I got there, um, I got half a vacation paid for. I think it's just not appropriate. You you can do you, but I find it to be much more effective if everyone there is focused on work. So that however you wanna do that. The other piece, modeling good traveling, I have quite a few staff and teachers who have never left Maine and never been on an airplane. And that was really, really scary for them. And so we had to um, really model like this is what a carry on, like this is how big it can be. This is the liquid sizes. This is how you check in for a plane. This, they just didn't know those were those were new concepts for them. And so we really wanted to um, 
be very, very open and and transparent about this is what this trip is going to be and, and give step-by-step -step implicit directions, just like we would to a classroom. Um, I would over-prepare your staff. So, and I'll share some of the things that we did, but we met frequently prior to say, this is what we're going to look for. This is what we're going to, this is our go-to is what we're trying to bring back from this conference. And then I would reconvene very quickly upon your return because all those ideas go away really fast and you forget and you go, oh, what was that thing? So I would reconvene quickly and um, talk with the staff about what are we going to implement and what did we learn from this? Those would be my things. So I wanted to share a couple resources with you. Um, that I have. So this was our addendum proposal that we shared um, as part, we attached it as part of our um, application. If you want to look at it, you can. I'm a nerd and I like doing research and I enjoy it. So for me, it was really fun to do. If you look at it and decide that would give me a panic attack, don't do it. It's just something that's the way I do it. It's the way my brain works. So it was good for me, but you don't have to do it that way if you don't want to, however works for you. Um, oh, this went away. Hold on. Uh, where'd my thing go? Hold on, guys. Sorry about that. Oh, nice. There's my email. Everyone can read. I don't know why. Hold on. Sorry, everybody. You can see it. I think it says the MDOE presentation. Yeah, but I can't. My um, cursor won't go up there for some reason. Okay. Ah, okay, hold on. <gasps> Guys, I'm so much better than this. There you go. Okay, so then I also gave my staff a travel brochure because, um, like I said, some of them had never traveled before. And so we were very specific. So here was our brochure. Here's who went. Here was our very specific itinerary with amounts of everything. Um, here was our flight information, our hotel information, how to travel, carry-ons. We had long talks about anyone who's been to, you know, any kind of summer camp or I don't know, sleepover in high school, people get tired and cranky and impatient and grumpy. And so we're all going to work on traveling and being great travelers together. It sounds silly, but I really didn't want to deal with any fighting and drama, you know, amongst my staff. And so I recommend something like that and some pretty serious talks. People who have been in COVID and haven't traveled in years, and now all of a sudden you're putting a group of nine or 10 or 15 staff members together in very tight quarters, all kinds of fun comes out. And so we just want to be patient and kind and drama free throughout our adventure. Um, the other piece that's really important is this is the, the link to federal reimbursement rates, which is really important as you book hotels, there are limits you put in the zip code of the place that you're going to, because you know if you're going to Duluth, it's not as expensive as going to New York City. And so hopefully, and so it gives you the rate of how much you can spend on a hotel. And then also it gives you your meals reimbursement rate. And so you don't want, you can't just go crazy. There's all kinds of loss on taxes and tips and everything. And, um, and, and I became very familiar with that because I didn't want anyone to have to pay out of pocket for this trip, you know? And so I wanted to be very transparent about this is how much you have and how to get reimbursed. So those were the resources um, that I shared with you. I, I went quick. I know I talked fast but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have, or you can always email me and I'm happy to help out. But I can tell you that attending um, as a group, and we're doing it again in, in April, attending that there is no, there was no, um, there's no um, substitute for how much it brought our staff together and the effect that it's had on our school. The other thing we've done in order to spread it, because I have people who will not fly, they're scared to death, or they have family situations where they just can't get away, and we didn't want them to miss out. So um, we did share, you know, through a staff meeting and everyone shared out their experiences. But then also what we've implemented is teachers who are using those strategies that we learned were doing, um, they, they set, send out a message, you know, hey, on this day, and then we sub out for whoever wants to go in and watch for 15 or 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and then reconvene and discuss that after. And so they're able to watch in real time their colleagues 
implement those strategies and then discuss, hey, how would I implement those as well? And so we're really working to make it school-wide. We didn't want it to be, um, these people went and and so this little cluster of people are doing these great things and it's and the rest of the school is continuing on the same trajectory. We wanted it to spread. And so we've worked really hard to um, get that school uh, school wide for everybody. I think that's all I have, Kathy, unless I missed a bunch of stuff. One of the, no, you didn't miss anything. Uh, one question I still have is you're going back. How did you determine the reasons for the value of going back again? I'm curious that you so, can share. So we went through that same process where we put out a ton of different ideas. Of, there are so many professional developments and some of them are just amazing. And so we really did present a bunch of ideas and everyone shared why, why they thought that would be the best one. Um, at the end of the day, it was determined that people who couldn't attend, who want still wanted to attend, really wanted to go. And and, and where, where we went, we went to the Ron Clark Academy, which is in Atlanta, and it's a working school. And you go watch, you go sit in classrooms and watch these master teachers and then debrief with them. Um, but there's so many things at that school, it's very overwhelming. So some of the people who had already attended said, I'd really like to go again because the first time I went, all I noticed was like, there's fire breathing dragons and all these great things. I really would like to go again and just focus on the components of teaching. So we've been fortunate. Um, so we determined that would be the best thing for us to go again with a couple people who already went and then the people who still wanted to go and couldn't attend prior. Um, we've also reached out to those teachers since since they've been there before and they've been emailing and, and um, like DMing on Instagram a lot. And so those teachers actually, I think the, the Ron Clark teachers are like going to dinner with us one night. And so we were able to build some connections that hopefully we can get some really good information and ideas from them on um, implementation and, and what we can bring back. 